In this part, we are going to talk about proton NMR applied to polymers. There are many advantages of proton NMR over carbon-13 NMR. Quantitative analysis is easily obtained, but it is not the case in carbon-13 NMR. Proton NMR has higher sensitivity as a consequence of this the analysis time is shorter than in carbon-13. The information obtained from the scalar coupling proton-proton is very useful for the interpretation of the spectra. The hydroxyl and nitrogen proton signals that cannot be detected in carbon-13 NMR can be easily observed in proton NMR. The olefin protons appear in a different region than the aromatic protons, which does not occur in carbon-13 NMR. Those advantages compensate, in part, the small chemical shift range that it is only of about 10 ppm. Before to enter in the application of NMR in polymers, let's see the sample preparation. This course is only about NMR in solution. Polymers are not all soluble especially those that have interchain links. So those cannot be studied by solution NMR. The others can be prepared normally. For those that dissolve at room temperature, it can be used as reference tetramethylsilane and for high temperature NMR, hexamethyldisilaxane. In many cases, one of the main signal of this the sample, it is used as reference. Solvents should be deuterated to lock the frequency of the field, or it might be used as a deuterated solvent. Deuterated chloroform is a good solvent for rubbers, such as polyisoprene or polybutadiene, that dissolve at room temperature. Deuterated 1122 tetrachloroethane is a good solvent for polyolefins that only dissolve at high temperatures. Chlorinate benzene, that such as orthodichlorobenzene or 246 trichlorobenzene, are also good solvents to this, uh, for polyolefins at high temperatures, but in this case it should be used a deuterated co-solvent. Deuterated benzene is used in 15 to 20 percent uh, to obtain um, the log signal. The advantage to, to, to use this combination of solvents is that deuterated benzene is less expensive than, for example, deuterated tetrachloroethane. Polyolefins are, between the polymers, more difficult to dissolve. For example, polyethylene only dissolves at 120 degrees and polypropylene at 140 Celsius degrees. In this table, there are shown the boiling points and vapor pressures of some solvents for polyolefins. We could never use pure deuterated benzene to dissolve polyolefins because its boiling point is inferior to the solution temperature. But we can use it as co-solvent in volume percentage inferior to 20%. Thanks to Dalton and Raoult laws, we know that the total pressure of a mixture of solvents is the sum of their molar fraction multiplied by their vapor pressure. Using a mixture of 20% of deuterated benzene and 80% of orthodichlorobenzene, the total pressure is inferior to the atmospheric pressure. If we take into account that we have also the polymer in the NMR tube, there is no risk to use benzene as co-solvent, even at high temperature. What about polymer, polymer concentration? The most concentrate the polymer solution is 
the strongest are the NMR signals. But the problem is that increasing the concentration also increases the width of the peaks, which may mask less abundant nuclei resonances. So it is better to concentrate less, to have thinner lines, that means a better resolution, and to accumulate more to obtain more intense lines. In general, in general uh, you can have a good spectrum with polymers using 50 milligrams in 5 millimeter tubes or 200 milligrams in 10 millimeter tube. In this way, you can do both proton and carbon-13 NMR with the same sample. Let's see now some proton NMR applications to the study of polymers. In all these applications, we are going to use the area of the NMR signal or integral because they are proportional to the number of protons generating that peak. Proton NMR is good for polymers that have functional groups because due to their electronegativity, heteroatoms, this shield some resonances that take off from the others. In this copolymer of ethylene-1-xenol, the only resonance that is separate from the other aliphatic protons is the CH2 adjacent to the hydroxyl functional group. Thanks to this, it is possible to calculate the amount of each comonomer. We know that this signal at 3.47 ppm corresponds to two protons of the 1-exenol unit. As in this example, this integral is 1. One proton of this unit corresponds to an integral of 0 0.5. The other protons are all in the main signal. That means four protons from the ethylene unit and nine protons from the one external unit. So to the total integral, 93.42, we discount the integral of nine protons of one external. That means the integral of one proton, 0 0.5 multiplied by nine. Then we divide by four, to have the integral of one proton of ethylene. Once that we have the integral value of one proton of each extractor, we calculate the molar fraction and the percentage. In this case, we have only 2.2 mol percent of one exenol and 97.8 percent of ethylene. Copolymers containing aliphatic and aromatic protons can also be studied by proton NMR as the ethylene-estyrene copolymer. The signal of the aromatic protons corresponding only to estyrene appears in a very different region compared with the rest of the protons that are aliphatics. In this way, the amount of each comonomer is easily obtained. The integral of one proton of the estyrene unit can be obtained dividing the aromatic resonance by five, as there are five protons in this integral. The protons of the ethylene unit are obtained using the aliphatic signal, discounting the two protons of the estyrene unit that are superposed. As we know, the integral of one estyrene proton, we use this value for this calculus. The integral of one proton of the ethylene unit is obtained dividing this value by four, as there are four protons of ethylene unit in this signal. In the previous cases, we obtain the molar fraction and then the percentage of each unit using the integral of one proton of each structure. In this spectrum, the value obtained is 0 0.3 mol percent of estyrene in the copolymer, the rest is ethylene. Ethylene vinyl acetate is also a copolymer 
with functional groups and aliphatic protons. The methane proton of the vinyl acetate unit appears as a multiplet around 5 ppm, A in the spectrum. And the methyl from the acetate group is a singlet at 1.9 ppm, named as B. From these two resonances, it is possible to obtain the integral from one proton of this unit. Of course, that the integral from the methyl group should be divided by 3. When there is the possibility to calculate the integral from many signals, it is good to take the integral average to minimize errors. In this case, we found that the integral of one proton of the acetate unit was 9. To calculate the amount of ethylene unit, we can use the sum of the signals C and D because they are not easy to separate without error. The big signal is due to two protons from unit A and four protons of unit E. So we must discount to the total integral, in this case 284, two protons from unit A and divide the result by four to obtain the integral of one proton of the ethylene unit. We calculate the molar fractions and the percentage, and we obtain that this copolymer is formed by 12% of vinyl acetate and 88% of ethylene. Some polymers resulting from step polymerization can be also characterized to verify if the correct structure was obtained. It is the case of polydiethylene glycol m eftalite, where all the protons are perfectly identifiable. The three types of aromatic protons are well separated, as the two types of aliphatic ones. It is possible to calculate the integral of one proton of each structure and use the average integral to confirm that each unit is in the same amount than the other, as it is expected for this type of polymerization. Another interesting example is the polymerization of 1,3-butadiene that gives two types of monomeric unit resulting from the 1,4 and 1,2 additions. The unit that we are going to call 1,4 has two geometric isomers, cis and trans. The unit 1,2, due to the presence of asymmetric carbons, has two stere stereoisomers, isot isotatic and syndiotatic. It is possible to calculate easily the amount of 1,4 and 1,2 unit by proton NMR. But to calculate the amount of isomers of each structure is necessary to have the carbon-13 NMR. Here we show how to calculate the percentage of units of 1, 2, and 1, 4 in the polybutadiene spectrum below. The signal at 5 ppm corresponds to two protons of the vinyl from the 1, 2 unit. So one proton of the 1, 2 unit has an integral of 5.4 divided by 2, that is 2.7. The signal at 5.5 ppm corresponds to two protons of the 1,4 unit plus one proton of the 1,2 unit with the total integral of 34.4. So to obtain the integral of one proton of the 1,4 unit, we have to discount the integral of one proton of the 1,2 unit. In this case, 2.7 and divide by 2. Once we have the integral of one proton of each structure, we can calculate the molar fraction, dividing this value by the sum of the integral of each unit. To obtain the percentage of each unit, we have to multiply by 100. So this butadiene has 14.5% of 1, 2 units, and 85.5% of 1,4 units. 
If we have a copolymer estyrene butadiene as the SBES, we have to treat it as a terpolymer composed by estyrene units, 1, 4, and 1, 2 butadiene units. In this case, we can obtain the amount of estyrene using the protons from the phenyl group that is in the aromatic region, very separate from the olef olefinic and aliphatic protons. So we divide the integral of the phenyl protons by 5 to obtain the integral of one proton of estyrene. The other units are calculated in the same way that it was done for polybutadiene. One, we have the integral of one proton of each unit. We divide by the sum of the three integral, obtaining the molar fraction, and then multiplying by 100 to obtain the percentage. So this SBS is composed by 21.2% of estyrene units, 70.3% of 1,4-butadiene units, and 8 0.5% of 1, 2 butadiene units. As we can see, proton NMR does not lead to have information about the distribution of sequences in which these units are disposed. This information can only be obtained by carbon-13 NMR. In low molecular weight polymers, it is possible to identify terminal groups and determine the number average molecular weight. Here we have the case of a polyethylene obtained by a methylocene catalyst that normally has a methyl group in one end and a vinyl group in the other. The resonance at 5.8 ppm corresponds to the methane proton of the vinyl terminal group. The integral of this proton can already be used to calculate the terminal groups, but it is also preferable, when it is possible, to take the average from multiple signals. Thus, we can also use the resonance at 4 point, uh, ppm due to the two vinyl protons and at 2 ppm due to the two allyl protons the integral of this signal might be divided by 2 to obtain the integral of one proton of the terminal group. The methyl from the other terminal group could also be used, but it is not advisable because this signal can have more errors due to the fact that many aliphatic solvents or branches have signal in this region. So, the integral of one proton of the terminal group can be obtained by the average of the three signals. The integral of one proton of the chain is obtained by the integral of the main signal at 1.2 ppm divided by 4, taking into account that each unit of polyethylene has four protons. The polymerization degree, or number of units of polyethylene present, is obtained dividing B by A. To obtain the molecular weight, we must multiply this polymerization degree by the weight of the polymer unit, in this case ethylene, that means 28 grams. To be more precise, we can add the methyl mass, that is 15 grams, and the vinyl terminal group mass, that is 41 grams. In general, these values are negligible compared with the chain wave. Our last example of the use of proton NMR is the isotatic polypropylene. In carbocentyl NMR, there are only three signals corresponding to each type of carbon, methylene, methane, and methyl. Correlating carbon-13 NMR with proton NMR in polypropylene, it is possible to see that the two protons of the CH2 from isotatic polypropylene are not equivalent. This is a difference with syndiotatic polypropylene, where those two protons are perfectly equivalent. Here there are some references.
Thank you.